Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Welcome to Known. Happy Easter. You know, again, this is the greatest day in history where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. The, the, the moment that changed history. The moment that, that still to this day we, we believe and we celebrate and we're excited about what Jesus and God has done. And the beauty of it is that, is that the resurrection wasn't just a moment in history, but it's a person. And that person's name is Jesus. And so the things inside of us that, that, that God has placed inside of us, I believe that we can live in this place where the dreams that God has given us that we let die can come back to life again. And we can start to see the beauty and more of who he is. But thank you for coming to celebrate Easter with us today. And if you're new and you don't know me, my name is Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here, along with my wife, Beth, who's sitting right there in the front row. Um, we're excited that you're with us today because Easter is such an important time of year, right? It's a time of reflection, a time to celebrate, a time to get together and eat meals together and, and have communion. And we had a part of that on Friday when we gathered and we ate a meal and we celebrated Good Friday together. But the beauty of Jesus coming back to life and the resurrection and the man that was once dead is back to life again. The man who loves us and loved us so deeply, he gave his life to save us and rescue us. And if you're new or you missed, uh, you missed some of the past few Sundays, we're in the middle of this series that we've been going through called The Locked Door. And really what we're going through is some of the major things holding us back from our potential or our future or the things that are holding us back from living the life that God has called us to live this abundant and beautiful life. And some of the things we've been going through is we've talked about fear and how oftentimes we lock ourselves behind fear because that's where we feel comfortable or busyness, and, and busyness is something that that's, I think is facing our culture um, more and more almost every single day, how busy we are as human beings. We talked about intention, and we talked about unforgiveness, and we've talked about, we're going to be talking about even more things, chaos and tradition and the mundane, but today I want to share a new a message with us this Easter that comes from the Easter story, but it's this idea that we've locked ourselves in unbelief. That we've locked ourselves in unbelief. And this entire series comes from a moment on the Easter weekend when that the, the, the says that the disciples had locked themselves in the upper room. Why? Because they were afraid of the Jews and the Jewish leaders. They didn't know what the future was going to look like. And so for them, locking the door was safer than stepping out into the, into the world and being the light in the world. It was safer to hide than it was to go. And I think for a lot of us, there's a lot of things that kind of hold us back. But I think for some of us, it's this idea of unbelief. And I think that this is a big problem we're facing as humanity. We're trapped in unbelief. And I think the question is why. And I think there's a lot of reasons why. But I think part of it is this whole idea of artificial intelligence. Have you noticed this? And it's crazy because you can go and there's people that are going into AI and they're, they're getting songs to be written by artists that don't exist. And they kind of sound like kind of good. And there's even like people who are in school are using AI to write their papers. And I've even heard stories of pastors using AI to write their sermons and their messages. And now I don't do that, I promise, okay? I promise you I don't do that. You can probably tell, you know, it's like, you're actually being like, <laughs> this is, this is, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. And we've also in this culture and this idea and this, this society where not telling the truth has become very common. And we see this in every aspect of society. We see it in politicians and we see it in pastors and we see it in parents and we see it in kids and we see it in our spouses and we see it on media and we see it on social media. There's this idea of what's actually true. 
right? Because there's so many ideas or, or, or thoughts out there when it comes to all the topics that it can be hard to think like, like, what do I actually believe? And I think we've got caught up in this idea of unbelief. And it might even be when it comes to the Bible, or even when it comes to Easter weekend, that when unbelief or doubt can try and creep into our thoughts or creep into our minds or even creep into our traditions that we have. And I want to encourage you with this is the reality is that you aren't alone if you're struggling oftentimes or sometimes with unbelief and doubt. I think sometimes when, we're, when we have doubt, there's a shame that kind of builds up inside of us. We're like, I don't think I can tell anybody that I have some doubts or I have some unbelief right now. And so what happens is we start to think we're alone when it comes to it. And we're too scared to ask the questions or we're too nervous to actually share how we're actually doing when it comes to doubt that we hold it inside. And I think we have to have this moment where we open ourselves up and be honest with people that we trust about how we're actually doing. Now, I want to start uh, this morning with this moment, this, this scene where they get to the tomb. And so we're going to read it. It's the tomb. It's, it's, it's John 20, verse 1. It says this, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Now imagine this moment of pure chaos, right? You go to the tomb, you're gonna mourn the death of Jesus and you get there and he's gone. You get there and he's gone. She finds that the tomb is empty. She goes, where's Jesus? That they've even taken his body away? Like, we can't even have a moment where we can have a place to come and, and mourn his life. We don't have a place we can come, you know, and visit like we do when people pass away. We go to their, you know, grave. And we, there's like, geez, like, they even took away his body? How could things get any worse? This is kind of what's rolling in Mary's mind. Imagine that scene. You go to the funeral and the body's missing. They're like, we don't know where it is, but I promise you we're going to find it. That'd be a weird moment. And this is kind of the scenario of, she's like, uh, guys, like, like bad news, bad news is Jesus is missing. His body is gone. I don't know what to do. And in verse three, it says this, Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running. Now, I love that they were both running because like, we got to get, we got to figure this out, right? Jesus is gone. I'm going to run. We're going to figure this out. Now, it's funny how the story goes, but the other disciple outran Peter. I love that that's in there. He's like, I'm faster than Peter. And he reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. Well, the cloth that covered Jesus' head was folded up and laying apart from the other wrappings. And this part right here, verse eight, then the disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. This moment where the, he saw and he believed. And then verse 10 says, then they went home. I love how, like, it's so simple. Then they just decided it's time to go home. It's like, wow, I believe. And then they went home. I love that part. It says they, they believed, they saw and believed. They didn't understand. If, if you read through the stories, like, like Jesus talked about this moment and he, and he kind of foreshadowed, he kind of explained it. But of course, until they had seen it, they, they didn't even know what was actually gonna happen until this moment where they get to the tomb and the tomb's empty. It says they saw and believed. He's risen, he, he must be back. They hadn't seen Jesus yet, but they're like, this idea started to come up, is he back? Like, is he still back? And they, they saw the tomb, they saw the wrappings, and they saw and they believed. So I think when it comes to unbelief, one of the biggest parts of it is we have to taste and see how good Jesus is. And not, not live on the experiences of our parents or not live on the experiences of our grandparents, not live on the experiences of even our spouse, but to actually have a moment 
where we ourselves taste and see, understand, experience how good Jesus actually is. I think for some of us, maybe we've grown up in church and we know the Bible. We might know the verses, but we don't know the author. We don't know the one who penned the words. We don't know whose story it is. We know the Bible, but we have never experienced Jesus. We have to experience his goodness and his beauty. Then we can understand that it's not even about tradition or rules. It's not just about the law, not just about being religious, but it's about having a relationship with Jesus. See, a relationship with Jesus is so much more than just a way to live a more moral life. See, that's a part of it. It's not just a way to make it through. It's not just a way to have to, to make it through. It's, it's not just a way for that, but it's a way to have actual life change for the th- broken parts of who we are to actually fall off, for addictions we've had for decades to actually fall off and we can experience actual freedom. It's so much more than just a way to live a better life. It's a way to have our entire life changed for the better. And when I look out in this room, I can see stories of God's goodness. And I've heard the stories of what God has done. And and I just, it builds my faith of saying, man, if he did it for me, if he did it for you, he can do it for everyone. The things that God has rescued me from, and the things that he's taken me from and brought me to places I couldn't even have imagined. And I look out and my faith builds because I know we all have a story of God's goodness. And I think whether we can recognize it was him moving or not, God has been moving in our lives. Again, Jesus didn't just go to the cross so we could be more moral, but so that we could be full, so that we could be forgiven. We have to live in the fullness of the original design, a way to bring us back to the Father, a life that is full of life. I think sometimes we go through life and we live our lives afraid to die. We live our entire lives being like, ah, I got to do all these things to make sure that I don't die. But the reality is, if we're all we're focused on is not dying, we're never actually truly living. See, we've got to go through life and we've got to live this life that God has called us to live. This abundant life that he's called us to live filled with purpose and filled with love. That's the life we're called to live. And I think sometimes when we step into this place of unbelief, we're just waiting behind a locked door when our life is on the other side of it. We have to try to unlock the door of unbelief because I know it can be hard. You know, it can be hard when we look out and we look at our situation, we look at our circumstance, we look at our life and we think the biggest question I think we ask is, God, where were you? Or God, where are you? I think one of the biggest questions that we ask as culture is, you know, if God is so good, how, how come this happens and how come this happens and You know, those are deep questions and hard questions to, first of all, even ask, and number two, to answer. And I think sometimes we try and have the answers, and and I think for in my life, I get to this place is I don't understand all of it. I can't can't stand up here and say, I I get it, I know why this all happens. I don't always know. But one thing I do know is that I've tasted and seen how good God is, and I trust him. I don't trust God. You know, I don't trust anything, but I trust Jesus. We got to be focused on living. We got to ask the questions and learn to believe. I want to share with you another story from the Bible that comes actually right after how we started the series, right after the disciples have this encounter with Jesus in the upper room after they've locked the door. They're saying, what do we do? After they have this encounter with Jesus, this part of scripture comes next. And it's John 20, verse 24 to 29. And one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. I don't know where he was. Maybe he was hiding somewhere else. And they told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it. Unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. He's saying, I'll only believe it if I see it. You ever hear people say stuff like that? 
I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it. I'll believe that this is going to change or that's going to happen. You, maybe you, you say that to your kids. You're like, hey, clean your room. They're like, I'm going to do it. You're like, I'll believe it when I see it. I'm going to eat my supper. I'll believe it when I look at your bowl and all the food you loved yesterday is gone. I'll believe it when I see it. This is, this is Thomas. And I think we often look at Thomas, at least for me. Now, I've read this story so many times. I look at him. I'm like, Thomas. Like, figure it out, man. All, your, all the disciples, all your friends are saying, we've seen Jesus, and Thomas is like, you're liars. Right? You ever hear a friend tell a story? You're like, no way. No chance. That is not true. I had this moment in school where my friend came to school one day, and he's like, yo, I went to a concert last night. We're like, sweet. He's like, I caught the drumstick from the drummer. That's a cool moment. You've ever been to a concert, get the drumstick, you're like, wow. And then you're like, now what do I do with this, right? Because like, no, no one's going to believe you. But he comes to school, he's like, yo, I got the drumstick. We're like, oh, sweet, bring it, bring it to school tomorrow. He's like, all right. Comes to school the next day, he's like, I didn't bring it. My dad said I'm not allowed. And we're like, okay, buddy. So then we find out, we talk to his dad. He's like, no, he didn't catch a drumstick at the concert. And he goes, I said I didn't catch the drumstick at the concert. That's what he told us. We're like, I don't believe you, you know. I'll believe it when I see it, right? We're asking for proof. And this is Thomas. And I think we, sometimes we look at him like, man, figure it out. But then I look at my own life. I'm like, I think I'm, sometimes I'm more like Thomas than I am like the other disciples. Sometimes I'm more like Thomas where I've, I've seen Jesus do the miraculous. But I'm like, what about now though? What about my situation now? Yeah, you did that five years ago. Yeah, you did that for my mom 15 years ago. But what about now? I want to see you now. He's going to have to come through another locked door if I'm going to believe. This is Jesus' attitude. And this is what the next verse says. Eight days later. So imagine Thomas is walking around eight days with the disciples being like, you guys are liars. Stop telling me the story. Go catch some fish or something and leave me alone. I will believe it when I see it. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. Here we go again. The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. And he says the same words, peace be with you. Peace be with you be with you eight days later they find themselves locked in the room again eight days later they locked themselves once Jesus came they're like eight days later let's hide in the room maybe he'll come back you know like I don't know he has this way of walking through locked doors let's see if he does it again you know but this moment of eight days is Jesus back or is he not Thomas was probably wrestling with this. He's like, my friends believe it so deeply, but I haven't seen it yet. And it's be, I think it's a kind of a, a, an image for us is that our faith can't be based on someone else's experience. I think sometimes our faith is based on what God did for somebody else. And of course, that can build our faith. It can get us excited. But unless we have the faith for ourselves, it's going to be a harder journey. We've got to... No, see him for ourselves. Is Jesus back or is he not? This question I'm sure wrestling through his mind. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. He knew. He's like, I heard you, man. Check this out. Look at my hands. Look at my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe and he says, my Lord, my God, Thomas exclaimed. He's like, wow. Then Jesus told them, you believe me because you have seen me. And he says, this part is powerful. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. You know, I think for me, there's this idea of time travel, you know. And like people are like, where would you go to if you could time travel? Like, I'd want to go to this moment, you know, to see this. To see this moment of 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 Jesus in the room and just the awe and wonder of what it would look like. But Jesus says it's easier to believe 
when you see the holes in my hands and my feet, but it's harder to believe when you haven't seen this part of it. And that's kind of where we're at in this place. Blessed are those who believe. It's harder. We have to see his glory and see him working in our lives because he is. He's working in each and every one of our lives in deep and powerful ways. I think sometimes we got to open up our eyes to the blessings, not always the burdens. To open up our eyes to the victories, not often always the failures. I think oftentimes it's easy to walk past the victory than it is easier to walk past the failure. I think as humans, we, I don't know if it's just the way we are, we, we're so focused on failure. We're so focused on mistakes or, or, or imperfections. And, and I know as humans, when we look in the mirror, at least for me, my first thing, every time I see is always imperfection. Every time I look at myself, imperfection. I'm like, I really hate this, this cowlick that always flops down. And I'm like, mom, why did you give me this cowlick, you know? It's true, like, I'm not joking. Like, it's just like, oh my God, like, come on, dude. Like, we notice the things that we don't like. When we look in the mirror, we notice the, the things that we wish were different. Like, God, like, why this? Like, why this part? We're so focused on the wrong things that we oftentimes miss out on the victories or the blessings because our eyes are looking for the failure. We're looking for the brokenness and we're not actually looking for the healing or we're not actually looking for the victory. We're gonna shift our eyes from the imperfections to the victory that God has already brought us. You know, it takes deep faith to believe even if we don't have that same moment that Thomas had. But what I love about this is that we're still standing on this faith today. The faith that these men in that room had to share their story in a world that wanted them dead. The faith of these men to stand up in the midst of a place where they knew the likelihood of them losing their lives or their faith was extremely high. To go out from the upper room. It happens multiple times where they go out in power. And lives are changed and we're still standing on this faith today. This moment propelled them into a future that was powerful, but it, le it led a lot of them to losing their lives for their faith. That's the faith that we stand on. That these men who gave it all so that we could still be here today and know that Jesus is back. You know, it reminds me of the story in the Bible it says there's this man, he was born blind and said he would beg at the gate. And this, Jesus and the disciples are walking past this man and they're like, what caused this? Like, theological question. God, like, or Jesus, like, why is this man blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? Like, like why is this? This theological question. And Jesus says, neither. He says this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. It's a very unique story. So then he makes this odd concoction of saliva and dirt and, and you know, give, rubs it on the man. He says, go to the pool and wash yourself. And the powerful part is, guess what? He comes back and he can see. Now, for most of us, if I saw this miracle, my first thought would be like, praise God, you know? That was the opposite reaction that most of the people had in this moment. The first thing he gets back and they're like, How? Is this the same guy? Some people are like, no, he just looks the same. Maybe he's his twin or something. Like, like maybe he just looks like him. They're trying to figure out how did this moment happen? And then the worst part of this whole story is that this man was healed on the Sabbath. Imagine. A man gets healed on the day of rest. And the, and the, the religious leaders are like, this is wrong. This, wait till tomorrow to heal him, right? Wait till tomorrow. Why does it have to be on the Sabbath? And then they even go into asking like Jesus, like, like how is, did Jesus bring this healing? Because Jesus is a sinner. Like he's a sinner, of course he is. Look what he's doing. He's not following what we're supposed to follow. And, and they even go to this man, they're like, how did this happen? And in fact, they go to his parents and like, was he born blind? They're like, yeah, he was born blind. And they're like, how does he see? He's like, they're like, I don't know, ask him. He's a grown-up. He's old enough. 
They're like, I don't want to deal with the consequence of this. So they go back to him and they're like, hey, were you blind? He's like, yes, I was blind. They're like, is Jesus a sinner? And this is his response, and I think it's so powerful. John 9, verse 25. I don't know. I don't know whether he's a sinner. I just started seeing this week. I don't know. I've never seen him sin. I, I couldn't even see. But I know this. This is what I know. I was blind, but now I see. I once was blind, but now I can see. I don't know. I don't really, he's saying, I don't know much about Jesus. He says, maybe he's a prophet. Probably he healed me. I, I couldn't see, now I can. I was blind, and now I see. It's a miracle. And I think we have moments in our life, and, and maybe it's just me, where sometimes I'm even like, like, God, like, where are you? Or, God, like, how come, how come everyone else is getting the miracle that I want? How come everyone else is getting the miracle that I want? How come everyone else is getting the promotion? How come everyone else is getting the race? How come everyone else is getting married and having kids? How come everyone else is getting my dream? Why? How come? We're like, I, 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 I think the beauty is, is we can look at it and say, I don't know. But I once was broken and now I'm healed. I once was lost, but now I'm found. There's power in our stories. And I want to encourage you that your story matters. All the good times, all the bad times you've gone through matter. And I want to also encourage you that God cares. He cares about the moments when you were a child and you felt lonely and lost. He cares about the moments when your heart was broken. He cares about the moments when you lost somebody that you love deeply. He cares about those moments. And, and I think the beauty of the church too is that our job is to care as well, to care about what you've gone through. And you know what's fascinating about this blind man is it got so bad for him that he got kicked out of the synagogue. They're like, you can't be here anymore, man. I know you think you were blind. I don't know if it's true. Jesus couldn't have been the one to heal you because he's a sinner. So you gotta get out of here, man. It's not safe for you here anymore. See, his story of healing, they couldn't explain. They couldn't explain with their own ideas. If Jesus is so bad, how could he heal this man? And on the Sabbath? can't believe this. And I want to share with you my story today because I know not all of you know my full story. I've shared pieces of it over, over time and how I got to where I am today. You know, it's interesting. I think I've shared this, but you know, when I was a kid, this did, being a pastor was probably the last place anyone would have thought I would be, to be honest, to a point where I told my wife's sister, because she at the time, she was the youth director at my church in Calgary. Beth told her she was kind of interested in me. And her sister was like, no way. Like, like, not that guy, anybody else but him, like for real. And uh, even, you know, Beth's parents, who, whom I love, same thing, they're like, are you sure? You know, like that guy, is that the real guy? Like, is that it? And for me, I, I grew up in a Christian family like maybe many of us did. And as a child, we attended Royal Oak Victory Church in Calgary, you know. That was my church for my whole life. You know, Royal Oak Victory Church. And I was always a handful in Sunday school, I'll be honest. Causing a ruckus, making friends, getting in trouble. That's always been my life. I've been a troublemaker since the beginning of time, okay. In fact, it was so bad that when I was in kindergarten. Uh, I was the only student in the history of that kindergarten where the teacher and my mom, we had a notebook and they'd write notes to each other about how I was doing that day and 
Because like I, I, I was a handful, like high energies. You can probably tell, still got it. When I was growing up, my, my family was so close, like really, really close. We used to go on these long road trips all summer. My dad would take the summer off and we'd go on these long, long, long road trips. And, you know, we drove one day, one time we drove all the way in through Texas from Calgary all the way down into Texas. And we had our tent trailer. And my dad was like, let's go to Mexico. So we went into Mexico with our tent trailer. Now, if y'all have ever driven in Mexico, it's, it's not the same as here. And when you're pulling a trailer, this guy was trying to take us to the market and we, he's like, come on. And we're like, it's a little tough, man. You know, we, so we drove into Mexico. Another time we drove all the way. My fa- our family in Quebec, so we drove into Quebec and we'd have some family time. We'd camp the whole way. We were close as a family, you know, growing up. And my dad, he, he, he traveled for work and he would often go, be gone for extended periods of time. He traveled all through the U.S. and he traveled all through Canada and he would teach customer service and business to automotive shops uh, across North America. You know, he, he'd go speak at conferences with thousands of people. I remember one day I was having a, a sleepover with one of my friends, my closest friends at the time, and I was, you know, maybe nine or 10 years old, and we were out sledding in November, when suddenly my friend's mom came rushing to us, and she loaded us in her car and rushed me to my house, about 25-minute drive, rushed me home, didn't say a word. And when I get home, I, I arrive at my house, and again, I, I don't really know what's going on. I arrive, and my, my grandparents were standing in our living room, and my, my mom had, had her bags packed, and she was just about to head out the door. And all, and all really that I remember, this was a long time ago, but all I really remember was she came and gave me a hug, and she was crying. She said, your, your dad's been in an accident. And she's like, I'm going to go, and Go, go see him. And that's basically the, the only conversation we had. And so my mom leaves and I'm standing there and my grandma comes, you know, gives me, this, gives me a hug and was comforting me. And she told me the rest of the story. See, my dad, he was on a business trip uh, to Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, a city that my dad always didn't like. And so whenever he'd plan trips there, he'd try and get in and out, like 24 hours, get in the morning, do his thing, get out. He did not like the city at all. And one, 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 while he was there, he decided he wanted some ice cream. And so he decided to run across the street. There's an ice cream place just across the street. And, and as he was walking across the street, there's this little kind of median and he tripped on this median and he fell forward and he got hit by a taxi uh, going about 80 kilometers an hour uh, in Las Vegas. And, and he obviously got rushed to uh, the hospital to intensive care. Um, and my mom met him there. <clears throat> And I remember, you know, as a kid, again, I was, you know, maybe 10 uh, years old. Like, how do you respond to a moment like this where you don't fully, like, I didn't fully get it. I didn't fully understand um, what was going on. Um, You know, the questions, I could tell more from the people around me how serious this was than I fully understood the incident. And and so anyway, he ended up in intensive care in the hospital for for a few weeks. And he had many, uh, many, um, surgeries to repair you know put, they got a rod in his leg they fixed up his wrist he had stitches kind of above his eye and um you know again we didn't know like it the questions were for me were like oh i see my dad again like what's this gonna look like because we didn't know right he was you know he was um in a coma for a while um my dad started to recover and and he got it got so good that he, they flew him home on a, on a Lear jet just before Christmas that year, which was amazing. So we were able to kind of celebrate Christmas with my dad in the hospital. We got this little like tree, you know, he put it like on the, you know, his table in the hospital. But this was kind of the start of a big kind of shakeup in my family because through all of this, my dad was doing well, but we started to experience a lot of loss as a family, kind of one after another. And we lost my grandma, my dad's mom, you know, uh, just a couple years later uh, to, to cancer. And then just a few months after that, my cousin, 21 years old, uh, fell and, and, and he died. He drowned in, in uh, the river in Red Deer when he was, you know, 21. That would have been my cousin, my dad's uh, nephew. And this all was happening. And and I remember, like, as a kid, I'd always hear my friends being like, yo, I went to this wedding, or my cousin had a baby, or I'm an uncle. And I'd be sitting there like, man, I've never been to a wedding in my life. I've only gone to funerals. Like, I think I'd gone to, like, 10, 20 funerals by the time I was, like, 15 years old. A lot of loss was coming in. And, and at that point, kind of through that journey, I was about 10 to 13 years old. 
that I had experienced so much more loss than I had experienced life. And my family kind of began to, to crumble and, and, and fall apart. And my parents eventually, my parents eventually split up. I was maybe 13. And so for me, as you know, you grew up in that situation, sometimes you're going between homes, you know, you're here and then you're here and then you're here for two days and then you're back. Like it can be kind of confusing as a kid. And uh, through it all, I began to, you know, as any teenager trying to figure out my life, like what do I want to do, you know? You know, and through the, all of it, I was going to church, I was going to youth, I, I was around, but I wasn't like fully present. And then when I was, one of those summers, I just, I, me and my friends, we got together, we started partying and I was like maybe 14 years old. Um, you know, cause I didn't know what to do with my life. I, I, I didn't know who I was really. You know, there was so much chaos and, and everything that I thought was perfect ended up just crumbling and I was left with a lot of brokenness in my own life and I didn't really know what it was gonna look like. And, and my whole life, the whole time, again, I was attending church, or still going to youth, mostly because my mom wanted me to go. She's like, yo, get up for church. I'm like, okay, you know, like, I'll go. And I never like fought it. I'll just go because I, you know, I wanted, I love my mom. I was having, I was like, no, I'll take care of you. There's moments where I used to steal money from her so I could go buy alcohol when I was probably 14. Um, no wonder, you know, some people were like, maybe he's not the right guy for you, you know? This is, you know, this is my story. And I was trying to distract myself, you know, trying to figure it out, a young kid, trying to figure out what am I going to be about? Do I want to be about church or do I, and about Jesus or do I want to just kind of live my own life? What do I want to do? And then I went to a, a youth group camp through Victory Churches called Boot Camp, which is actually where I met my wife, Beth. True story. I showed up to this camp wearing a suit, like a full-on suit, and I was hungover. True story. And this is the week, this is the week I met my wife. And I didn't know, like, you know what I mean? I didn't go at the time. Like, I thought I was pretty cool though. You know what I'm talking about? Like I showed up, suit, I had a mullet too. True, like I'm not joking. I should have showed you the, story, the picture. Mullet, sunglasses, suit. And uh, I thought I was so cool. Beth did not think the same thing uh, that weekend, or that week, to be honest. Uh, Cause I was a mess, to be honest, emotionally, physically, all of it. I was just a, I was just a mess. You know, as this kid and, and so I met her, and then the next year we met, kind of met again, kind of reconnected. And uh, when, I, when I met Beth, you know, one thing I always valued about her and loved about her was her deep faith in Jesus. Because for me, like, my life was not really that way. I could fake it at church. I could fake it at conferences. I, you know, like, because I knew, I knew how to pretend to be that way. Like, I knew how to do it. I could trick people. But on the inside, there was so much just deep brokenness of not even knowing what I wanted to do. And but I remember I saw Beth and I saw her faith and I was like, man, this girl is so beautiful. I want to date her, you know? Like, that was it. So the whole week I followed her around camp. You know what I'm talking about? Did I talk to her? No, I was too scared. I just follow her around like this. She'd go into the, to the, to the cafeteria. You'd just see me pop around the corner like this, right? I'm like, I'm not joking. True story. And Beth was like, this guy's a weirdo. Like, because it's pretty obvious. You leave a room all of a sudden, I'm just like running into the room, you know, like, Look at me, you know, it's just like a true story again. And I wanted to date her. And then I, at the end of camp, I, oh, I was so tough. I was like, hey, let me help you with your bags. True, first time I talked to her really the whole week. Let me help you carry your bags. Like, how great am I, you know? And, and I carry her bags, I'm like, hey, how about those digits, you know? Like, how about I get your phone number, you know? So she gave me her number. I don't know why, to be honest. She gave it to me, the creepy guy from, from camp started to kind of get, you know, have this relationship. Again, this whole time I'm still struggling. I'm still going through so many things. And, and then when we're talking, she's like, yo, if you want to date me, you got to wait two years or you got to wait till I'm 18. I'm like, what? Like I'm 16 years old, 15 years old. I got to wait? That's going to be, that's going to be a no for me, dog. You know, like that was it for me. I was like, no way. Two years? Like I play on the football team at school. Like two years, I'm going to wait for you? I'm, I wish this wasn't a true story, but it is, okay? I wish I had a better attitude and I was like more like holy in this moment. I was not. And so we started connecting and I was struggling and struggling and struggling. And then she went to what's called Youth with a Mission in, um, in Spain. 
stopped. And so she was gone. So most of our relationship has been like long distance because she lived in Edmonton. I lived in Calgary. Then she went to Spain while I was in Calgary. And then when she got back from Youth with a Mission, she came back. We went to Thailand. And then that September, I went to Los Angeles and Thailand for six months. So we, we barely ever lived in the same city, like pretty much ever. I lived in Edmonton for two months and worked uh, construction with Christian and Sam pretending to put up drywall for a whole summer. And again, I'm just being honest. They paid me, I don't know why, you know, like I just would vacuum all day and like pretend. And so, you know, I went to what's called Youth with a Mission and you know, one of the most powerful things for that for me was one of the first nights we were there, we just had this moment as, as a team, small team, 19 of us, we barely knew each other. We're all from different parts of the world. And that, that night we all just started randomly just starting to share some of our stories and our brokenness and our pain and our fear. And, and it was beautiful because what happened was is we're all these 19, 18, 19 year old kids in a room sharing our story, weeping together and crying together as well as celebrating together. I didn't even know them and I'm out here just like I'm talking ugly crying because I was so broken when I went. And we were together and we we grew so close over those six months and I grew so close to Jesus. Like when I share my story, I find it funny because I don't have this like one moment where everything changed. For me, it's this constant journey and flow of growing close to Jesus. And, but I remember sharing the pain, sharing the addiction, sharing the fear and the doubts. And rather than judge me as I was a crying mess, they hugged me and wept with me and encouraged me and cared for me. Something that, you know, I, I know people in my life wanted to do, but I hadn't opened myself up to it yet. I wasn't ready, I don't think. And I think that that, even that moment, I always, I forget about that moment, but I think that moment for me was being like, man, there's so much more to this relationship with Jesus than just what my mom has. And I wanna kind of end with this. I got love my mom and dad so much. Like, in fact, my mom's my hero, okay? Like, my actual hero. Um, but for me in my life, you know, I've gone through a lot as we all have. And unbelief always tries to come in, right? Even if you go back, if you remember in the Garden of Eden, you know what the, the enemy used was, did he really say? Did he actually say that? Don't eat that fruit. Did he really say that? It always tries to come in, the unbelief. Is it true? Did that actually happen? But I know for my life, I'm the one that was lost and I'm now found. The one who was blind, but now I can see I have tasted and seen his goodness. And to be honest, still to this day, unbelief tries to come in. Unbelief tries to come in and doubt tries to come in. You know, a circumstance might come up in my life that I don't see a way through. And doubt comes in. But I know that I have a community around me that cares for me, that loves me, and will be there for me no matter what. I love the church. You know, I loved the church when I was going through it. And I love the church now. You know, for me, I've dedicated the past 10 years of my life to the church because I love it. I love the church. See, I truly believe that one of the keys that unlocks the door of unbelief is an encounter with Jesus. Where it's no longer, again, out of tradition or someone else's faith, not out of the fear of death or the afterlife, but it's an encounter with the living God who loves me and loves you and sent his son for us to go to the cross and then be raised from the dead so that we could be found and so that we could see. To taste and see his deep love and peace, his deep care and generosity. You know, even when I'm experiencing doubt to this day, I, I realize that I need to draw closer to him 
and draw closer to my people, then I need to run away. Because in those moments, deep faith rises up in me. And I think another key is community. One of the keys to unlock unbelief is an encounter with Jesus. Number two is a community of people. I think this is the design of the local church is to be a community of people who might struggle, but we're there for each other in our hardest moments. Because what happens is we're not asking the questions on our own, the questions we have. We aren't going through it on our own. We have people around us that love us and people that are there for us. When we ask why, they say, I'll be here with you as you struggle through this. I might not have the answers, but I'll be here for you. I will walk with you on your journey of doubt. If you can't pray, I'll pray for you. If you can't walk, I'll walk for you. If you fall down, I'll come pick you back up. If you struggle, I'll be there with you. See, we have seen the people around us have victories. We see someone get the promotion or we see someone get the baby or we see someone get married. That can build up the faith inside of us as well to know if God did it for them, he can do it for me. We have seen their failures and we've seen them get back up. When we're around a group of people, our faith will rise up. You know, our takeaway today is this, is that we unlock the door of unbelief when we have a true encounter with Jesus and celebrate him in community. When we have an encounter with Jesus and then we celebrate him in community. And I think that's the beauty of the church. See, Jesus is alive today. Jesus is here today. Jesus came back from the dead. He defeated death. Jesus has risen and he's risen forever. And he did that for you and for me. See, and all we have to do is give him our life. To give him our brokenness. All the things we've locked ourselves in for years, saw. We say, I believe, I trust you. I believe, I trust you with my moment. I trust you with this situation. I trust you with this circumstance. I trust you with my brokenness. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you. I wanna encourage you, if you are struggling maybe with unbelief or you are struggling with doubt, I wanna encourage you. Maybe you just need to pray a prayer saying, God, I'm struggling, but help me trust you. Help me trust you with this moment. Help me trust you with my fear. Learn how to trust him. I want to give him an opportunity today. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus today. And one of the greatest things that we can do in, in life, the greatest thing we can do is give Jesus our life and say, God, I trust you. And, you know, one, how we can do this is it's not complicated. It's, it's really simple. We can just whisper this prayer to him or say it to him. It's so simple. It's just, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I give you the most broken parts, the darkest parts of my soul. I give them to you. I give you my greatest talents and I give you my greatest abilities. I give you my greatest victories. I I give you all of who I am, Jesus. I give you my life. And maybe you've never even prayed that prayer before. I want to encourage you. This might be your moment. Just whether you're watching us online, you're just in your room or in your living room, you can say that prayer to him. Or you're sitting in the house today, you're at church today, you can say that prayer to him. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my life give you all that we are. Jesus, I give you my life. Now I want everyone to just, let's just close our eyes and bow our heads and maybe maybe you said that prayer or you want to say that prayer maybe for the first time or maybe you want to say it again and say, okay, this is it. This is my moment. I want to encourage you again with every eye closed, you can just, you know, take a look at me. Just open your eyes and look up at me and I'd love to, to, to pray for you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, anyone else?
God, we love you. And today, God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room, or my brothers and sisters who are giving you their life or re-giving you their life today. God, I thank you for their boldness today, as well as this moment of an act of faith to saying, God, I trust you. And God, I pray that as our brothers and sisters give their lives to you, God, I pray that we as a church will be there for them in their hardest moments. That we won't let our own stuff get in the way but we'll be them, there for them. God, even today, we give you our lives anew and we say, God, we wanna live in the power and we wanna live in the beauty that raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus, we give you our lives today. And God, I pray for all of us today, our online or in-house, God, that are struggling even with unbelief. God, I pray that you stir up faith inside of us. God, I pray that you meet us in our pain, you meet us in our brokenness. And God, I thank you that we will leave those things in the grave, we'll leave those things in the tomb and that you will create something new inside of us. God, we love you and we give our lives to you today. God, for more than anything, Jesus, we say thank you for going to the cross and going to the grave and coming back again. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Let's give it up for Jesus again today.